Come over here. All right, thanks everybody for coming. Um, small, intimate gathering with pizza and beer stuff. We have Han here. Uh, my name's Benji, I'm from Shipyard. Um, ephemeral environments, super in the container space. But our big thing is to talk have to Han to give us a state of Docker Compose. Um, at the end, we're going to do a little bit of a uh, fireside chat thing where Han and I will talk about some things. Uh, we only have one microphone, so that's why I'm going to be holding this thing like this. Um, but the big thing is really that Docker Compose, this is my personal belief, doesn't get enough love. Um, we all use it. We don't talk about it. But guess what? It works, and everyone uses it. And like the analogy that I like to always give, which is – weird is just it's like you're giving like sharp knives to teach a child to juggle and it's just like no like you start with like you know i don't know those baton thing or maybe tennis balls like you know and so docker composes the tennis balls uh that sounds weird but <laughs> <laughs> docker compose is great and we love it and han's gonna tell us what's going on and i'm super excited um, about all the attention that Docker itself has given. So uh, I'll stop talking and Han's gonna give a little presentation. Um, Han is the PM of the Docker Compose project at Docker. Um, and they have been moving that project along and it's kind of coming back alive. Um, and then the last thing I'm gonna say, because we'll talk about this at the end, but I think my personal thesis is that the reason that Docker Compose doesn't get enough love is because it's feature complete almost. And so that's my big thing. Cause us nerds, we like to only work on things that don't really work all the way. Um, if it works, it's what are we doing? Um, okay. Han, give it up. All right. Thanks Benji. That was a good intro. I'm so glad that everybody is here. Um, so let me see if I can advance my slides in this way. Is this thing actually making a difference no, if no, I use it? Video. Oh, okay. I see. I see. Everybody can hear me. Everybody's just hearing me talk. All right. <laughs> All right. So I'm really excited that we put this event together. Yeah, that's going to help if I could just not be holding this hamster the whole time I'm trying to talk. All right. Let me see. Let me see. Sorry for the delay. Hold on one second. All right. So just to kind of orient a little bit, I would be very interested in knowing, like, of all the folks here in this room, like, how many of y'all are, like, you know, new to Compose, haven't really used it very much. Okay, what about like, okay, got it. You're making use of Compose already in your day-to-day, -day, right? And versus like, you feel like you got like an expert level of, you know, knowledge about it. You're kind of using some of the, some of the more advanced features. You got complex projects on it. All right, cool. I'm gonna try to calibrate uh, to, to what I saw over here. Um, so Compose, um, uh, what I wanted to talk about today um, is really just going to be, hold on a second, wait a second, that's, wait, <laughs> this is looping, let me see, all right, okay, you can still see this, right, I'm just going to move through the slides like this. So the structure of this is I'm going to stop, talk a little bit about, you know, how I came to the Compose project, where, you know, my, what my priors are, what sort of a, a frame of reference I'm coming to the project with. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about, like, what we've been doing on the Compose team, um, things we've been shipping in the past year, you know, what that indicates about our direction. And we're kind of going to end with, like, the, 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 the next steps where we're headed next um, with Compose. And here, um, I want to make it really clear that like I'm very glad to be in this room because it is absolutely true that a Docker, um, the extent to which I can understand um, the real use cases of this tooling and how people are, you know, making use of it to their data into their day to day into <laughs> in their day to day, is extremely important for um, the basis of. Uh, conviction and confidence in where we evolve this project. Um, it is very much rooted in having like an understanding of the patterns of where um, Compose is genuinely helpful for people. Um, and so in that sense, like, you know, as I, as I go through this, think about this as like, you know, I'm kind of presenting my thesis about uh, what Compose is, what it should be doing, 
and I want to hear from you ultimately about you know whether that applies to your use cases. That's why it's good that we have a little you know Q and A section at the end, and we can we can dig into it. And there's other opportunities to get connected as well. So um, about me, my priors. This is actually kind of a bit of a nostalgic moment for me because I used to work on something called Tilt, um, Tilt.dev, and uh, came to Docker through an acquisition. And in fact. We uh, started this project multiple years ago at Workbench, not in this exact location, just a few, you know, a little bit down the block. Um, some of the folks here also worked on Tilt together with me. And uh, what this tool was, was um, we had this original vision of bringing like the inner loop of development closer to, or rather bringing like this CI, the process, closer to the inner loop of, of development itself. Because the idea is like, you want to get that immediate feedback as quickly as you can, especially like as the complexity of your overall application grows, um, that you can be able to have a shorter feedback loop as you figure out um, the changes that you're making and the effect that that has. And the way that this functions is that we have a configuration file that you can define uh, the, the application in to do local development. And you have an interface where as you define your application, you know, you add services, your front end, back end, et cetera, that you can see those in the interface. And we want to make that loop very close and connected so that as you're making changes, um, you get to see uh, immediately what uh, is taking shape um, as you're making those changes. And th these basic elements, right, that you have a configuration file, and that you have the ability to interact with uh, the resulting uh, uh, interface that you understand the state of your services while you're doing development um, is really helpful because uh, it, we often in, in building Tilt saw this relationship where there would be a persona, we, you know, maybe we would call that like the producer persona. What they do is they're kind of the ones invested in setting up the development workflow for the rest of their, their team. And then you kind of have, you know, we can call them consumers uh, who make use of that configuration to be able to uh, do their day-to-day -day development. And with these elements, you can have a reasonable baseline that's set up uh, in the configuration, and then you have the ability to interact with it, bring up the services that you need, and then this interface that you understand what's happening as you're in the inner loop of development making those changes. Um, and very much so, like, the ideal here is, like, you keep people in flow when they are in that inner loop of development. When I say that phrase, I've said it so many times in the development work I, I've done that I kind of think of it as a, you know, commonly known phrase. But uh, when I refer to it, it's kind of like you have um, the code that you're changing, um, you know, you're working with these containerized services so that you're seeing the, the code be reflected in your application, and then you're able to do testing and debugging. And then ultimately, you know, when you're satisfied with the work that you're doing, you can deploy it to CI, CD, and that's exiting the inner loop at that point. And the, the thing that um, we think a lot about uh, with Tilt, and I find ourselves thinking a lot about as I've worked on Compose um, at Docker, is that there often can be this gulf between what you're trying to uh, optimize for the inner loop and ultimately what happens when you, you know, are ready to deploy the code. Um, as, as we have increasing levels of complexity for the applications themselves that are being developed, um, and as the demands for what, uh, you know, how you're deploying those applications so that you want them to have a lot of uptime and you want them to be very accessible, very robust. Um, generally, you find people making use of Kubernetes to manage like when that final deployment occurs. So you end up with this bit of a gulf between, uh, you know, the, the simplicity of Compose and, you know, the, and, and the simplicity level that you want um, in the inner loop and then what levels of, um, uh, I guess the full representation of your application that ultimately goes into production. And this is where there's, you know, uh, a lot of thinking about how you bridge this gap in a, in a functional kind of a way. Because part of the strength of Kubernetes is its immense, you know, flexibility and its massive ecosystem. You know, this is where we often refer to 
the CNCF landscape of all of the customizations and tooling and vendors that are available in the Kubernetes space. And yet, like, um, you know, if I think about what has drawn me to this work and made me so interested in, in Compose, maybe akin to what Benji said earlier, is, is the fact that it's, um, its simplicity, its mental model, I think is very well suited to the concerns that one has in the midst of the developer workflow itself, which is the services you're working on, how the services relate to each other, what you want to expose out of those services to do the kind of testing that you want to do. Um, and so um, I came to Compose, I think, with you know, the, this background of working on Tilt and seeing the benefit of creating this very tight um, loop for, the, uh, for development. And you know, Compose has many of these similar elements and you know, similarly is often used for local development. But uh, while Tilt had this um, uh, you know, programmable configuration with a variant of Python Starlark, um, Compose has YAML, um, this declarative configuration language. Compose has a CLI, a command line interface of Docker Compose, um, that command. And in terms of like the, the graphical interface, that's a piece that, um, you know, there's certainly graphical interfaces that you can find um, for Compose, but in terms of what Docker itself has, has offered to its users, I think that's been one piece that's a little bit amorphous, which, you know, more on which later. So um, this is, you know, where I talk a little bit more about what Compose team has been working on over the last time period. When I first joined the team about a year and a half ago, we were in the midst of this uh, big transition between um, the original version of Compose written in Python to the version of Compose Compose version two written in Go, which um, was really important because um, it made it much more compatible with the rest of the CLI tooling for Docker, and you know that leads to great efficiencies and being able to develop Compose and and pick up the pace of of improvements that we're making for Compose. Um, but the interesting th thing about this is like uh, Compose has evolved over such a long period of time. You know, it's ten years old now, actually that um, I think there's like this saying that like anything that is exposed uh, in an API will be used by somebody. <laughs> um, and so in this transition, in essentially rewriting Compose, we discovered some of these edge cases, you know, for example, like um, when uh, people have certain expectations about how environmental variables are made use of, that there were subtle distinctions, which you know we took a lot of time to make sure that it worked predictably um, with this update and put us in a good position. And what I want to talk a little bit about in gesturing towards the intermediate work that you know we've been kind of doing with Compose to kind of move towards this vision of allowing for um, you know bridging this gap to greater uh, greater you know ecosystem of complexity while retaining its simplicity is um, these couple of features which are thinking about the developer experience of Compose, like trying to make that better. Watch, talk about that in a moment. Um, and also trying to make it easier to reason about Compose um, projects as they grow. Because ideally, I think, you know, I want to support this, this workflow where it's something that's easy to get started with and to evolve and to grow more complex and that as your project um, uh, becomes a, comprised of more pieces that Compose should be able to grow with those projects. Um, so to talk a little bit about um, the first of these three, Compose Watch, uh, this was really trying to think about a very common use case we observe uh, for people who are doing um, containerized development, right? So like you have your service in a container and you want to be able to um, make some changes that are reflected in that container. Um, and f especially for some front-end focused use cases, you want to be able to reflect those changes in the container really quickly and essentially have like a hot reload experience, which is like, you know, table stakes for your for decent um, front-end based development. And we found that like there was some solutions and workarounds for this. You know, you could set up a bind mount, um, but we wanted to like really enhance this idea of like, a, you know, like a development mode for Compose to um, start to think about how to really support that inner loop. And um, so 
the the trick around compose watch is that you can specify like a like a directory that it's watching for changes and then you can say like do you want to like rebuild a container to create that kind of like a you know hot reload experience or do you want to just specifically sync the changed files into the container itself for an even fast response uh, even faster response where you know let's say you have a React or something that you know. Once you make the file change, React will pick that up and then display those those changes for you. Um, and the other piece of this is like trying to be thoughtful about how people don't necessarily always want like the two way sync of a of a bind mount, so that like you might be doing development work where sometimes you want some things to be synced into the container and sometimes you don't want those things to be synced or vice versa. And so Compose Watch was, was functionality to really try to help you be able to define exactly how you want to be doing that development work and making sure that you're able to uh, have the container behave as you wish for it to, to behave. Um, let me see if this little demo works. Yeah, so the idea is that like you're watching a directory and then when you bring in a change, it will automatically pick that up and then sync that into the container so that you see it right away. So as far as you're concerned, it's kind of like just like a hot reload experience. Um, and one thing that I thought about this is like um, containerization brings so many benefits of like being able to have that consistency, you know, no more like just works on my machine. Um, but it genuinely does introduce like additional uh, friction in terms of like a, a cognitive load. And so the idea here is like if we truly want to enhance the developer experience, it's to think about ways that you can kind of get the benefits of containerization while not um, having to uh, hold in mind all of those concepts uh, uh, and, and essentially just kind of do the work that you want to do. So you can try this, you know, Docker Compose Watch. It's it's available now. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about is uh, this Compose Include functionality, which um, it, you know, we often see people where their files um, for defining um, their services um, can sort of grow in terms of how many services are defined. And there's often different ways that people want to make use of their directory structure as they're putting their configurations in there. So this is to give a little bit more flexibility um, in being able to uh, essentially like make use of other compose def uh, other services defined in other compose files to sort of combine them together into a file with a little bit more um, flexibility while at the same time not having to understand all of the details of those services that you're bringing in so um, in a way it's like uh, there are other ways of combining um, services in compose like with extends um, that you might have to have a little bit of a knowledge of where those services are in that directory structure, but then this is trying to abstract it away so that you can combine those files together and have it run while making it a little bit more easy to reason about those compose files. Um, and you know, finally, uh, this is a very long requested feature that we shipped out, um, which is making it so that for any functionality in compose, you can add the flag to dry run and be able to see exactly what is going to happen, um, which we believe is something that is probably more helpful as you have greater complexity in your projects and services and want to make sure that you know, nothing uh, unexpected occurs. So in addition to all of that that I just mentioned, which I think of as like, almost like uh, interface or experience improvements for Compose, at the same time, we're evolving the Compose Go parsing library. Um, and also, we're trying to be good stewards of the Compose spec itself. So as we're developing Compose, it's also obviously very important to make sure that it's still functioning as expected um, for you know, all of the many people who are relying upon it. And so the Compose spec is, um, if you go to the repo where you can see uh, exactly the way that it is documented, how you can expect Compose to work. Um, and we introduced um, a process by which any change to the spec first is released as, as alpha before we merge it into the spec. And the Compose Go library, which follows a spec, um, 
is how you can, um, you know, how Compose itself parses the configuration files and how there's other tooling that also makes use of this uh, parsing library as well. And we've also been trying to improve Compose Go so that um, as we want to make it easier to mutate the model of all of those services that are defined, um, that we can do it in a more sort of predictable, immutable kind of a way. Um, so those are some changes that we've been, we've been making on the team. And I think um, as we're continuing to, uh, to evolve Compose, um, one thing that I wanted to sort of leave on here as a note is like that we have um, this current model where essentially like if you want to kind of change the set of services and uh, you know essentially your application that's in Compose, the interface with which to do so is you know that configuration file and then also the command line that is available through Compose. And generally, people manage this by putting things in version control, you know, putting it on GitHub, and then it's part of those projects. And you know, everybody who's making use of this checks it out. And when people want to have different permutations of what they're running in Compose, you have to pass things in through the command line as environment, environment variables or as flags. And often, we see people creating you know, their own custom you know, scripts wrapping compose um, command line for their own use case. So I think there's a really good opportunity here where as we're thinking about like, you know, this, this additional piece, this is meant to be representing an interface and API related to that, that like there needs to be some other way that you can, um, as like the person who is both dev setting up compose for your team, um, be able to um, set constraints and also, you know, make changes that is not purely dependent on just the what is inside the configuration file itself. And also at the same time, I think there's an opportunity for people who are just making use of this tooling day to day, right? Like for local, for just their own local development, that they should also be able to, um, on the fly, have um, changes without having to edit and make changes to either the configuration file in version control or to have a knowledge of all of the different flags and all of the different things to pass into the CLI itself. Um, and being able to do that, I think, is really important to maintain uh, a certain degree of flexibility on top of whatever has been defined, but also create more consistency from that perspective of that producer so that uh, you can try things and then also be able to then codify it, you know, and save it into those configuration files, but that, you know, it creates another entry point to that. That's kind of a, a direction that we've been thinking in with this Compose project. Um, I'm really interested in, you know, as I said at the beginning, how these uh, ideas, the, the direction that we've been evolving it, meets the particular use cases that you all have, the things that you've run into. I hope we can talk a little bit about that in the q and section. I also put this here because I'm always looking for people who are you know, using Compose in their day-to-day -to, -day to speak with um, and you know, learn more about your use cases so that it can really inform the direction that we're moving in with this project. <laughs>